love and your unbelievable hard work and your commitment to the kingdom and to your family. And I love you greatly. And I am seeing you differently uh, than I've ever seen you because it takes time for God to remove the, the, the pain of a heart that had not healed properly before you ever arrived. And now that God has shown me what unconditional love looks like, I see Jesus clearer because you love me. So I thank God. Um, I, that felt good. That's not good. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a good night. Um, I got a feeling. <laughs> Stop it. You guys are naughty. <laughs> um, first of all, to Darren Keto, um, he is one of the great men of God anywhere in the kingdom. One of the most committed, faithful, hardest working men. Can we celebrate Pastor Darren? I just want these people to know that when I went to the first Hillsong conference, um, you were the person that greeted me and encouraged me and treated me like I was someone of significance when no one knew who I was. And you can always tell the measure of a believer or a man of integrity based on how they treat people they don't actually need. You didn't need me. I wasn't a guest speaker. I was just a guy from America who was trying to see if God was more real than the religion that I had been subjected to. And you looked more like Jesus than many of the people that I grew up around. I want to honor you today. Allow me these moments to speak life because life is not promised. I'm sad today. I'm sad because today we lost uh, nine souls in a helicopter crash not many miles from here. And among those who we lost was someone that the whole world knew for their athletic prowess and their philanthropy and their love for their family. And not only did we lose uh, a global icon, but uh, we lost his daughter as well. We lost another family and a pilot. So many people are devastated tonight. Uh, this city is hurting. And I think that God knew, of course he knew that this would happen. Uh, and of all the times to be here, and I haven't been here in years, but God knew that we were gonna need to have a conversation tonight in LA. And I'm honored that he allowed me to be a part of this dialogue. And I'm getting ready to put the devil under our feet. And we're gonna make that Jesus. I just need to know if I'm in the right theater with the right choice. Because I believe that God wants to do something in here that gives us hope and the future. I just need to know if there's anyone in the balcony that will give God a praise with me. And on the floor, if you'll give God a praise. If you will, take a moment and go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from the New King James Version. What do you do when life doesn't make sense? What do you do when things don't add up? How do you process a sudden moment of grief that you were not prepared for and did not anticipate? How do you quantify a life? What are the lessons that we are to learn? How should we apply those lessons once we discern what they are? What is God doing today? Moments like this when the whole world is focused on what we lost, and rightfully so. Bigger question is, what will we do from here? Who are you going to be after this moment, because that 
will be the measure of how this moment will define you and I. For 20 seasons, this young man named Kobe Bean Bryant brought excitement and athleticism and excellence and passion and commitment and singular focus and determination to one common goal, to be the best that he could be and to make those around him better. He did not waver from that goal. He did not care if you didn't like him, and if you were on the team and didn't get in line with the program, you were not going to be on the team very long, because that's just who he was. Then, after 20 years of excellence, 18 all-star appearances, five NBA titles, an NBA MVP award, all-star MVP on his last game, he dropped 60 with 50 shots on busted up knees, messed up back, still needing to be healed Achilles and every other injury. He gave the game everything he had. He stepped off into the sunset where many thought he would just rest on his laurels, but no, he started another company and started doing media. And from there, he ends up winning an Oscar. Who gets an NBA championship and an Oscar in the same life? This is someone who will not be defined by one thing, but is willing to max out his life because the reality is you got one to live, so you might as well live it. The first lesson of the tragedy is to live your life to the fullest extent and make no apologies for your gifts, your talent, or your calling because you got one life in here. So stop minimizing who you are to make insecure people feel better. Don't just be great at one thing, be great at five things. Write a book, write a movie, take ballet, Learn how to play the flute. Be Lizzo. <laughs> Look at somebody, tell them, live your life. Second Timothy chapter 4, starting at the 6th verse. This is Paul, the apostle, Paul, this is his valedictory speech. This is the speech he gave at the end of his life. And when somebody is about to die and they start talking, you should sit up and take notice and listen to the words of a man that knows that he's coming to the end of his life. It's a rare gift to know when your end is coming because most of us don't know and many of us don't want to know. I don't want to know. I'd like to see it coming a long way off. I got this thing in my head. I'm going to be an old man, still going to have my teeth, and I'm going to be in my man, and my wife's going to be over here, and my kids, and my grandkids, and I'm going to pray over them and prophesy, and I'm going to admonish, and then and then I'm going to tell my wife, you can't get remarried, and if you do, I'm going to haunt you. And I ain't let no other Negro up in my house. <laughs> Sipping my lemonade, living up in my bed, sucking up my air conditioning. I'm going to be an ornery old man. I can't wait to get on. I'm going to be mean. Hi, Pastor. Shut up! <laughs> okay. It'd be nice if I could map it out that way, but the reality is no day is promised. So I better max out today. I got 30 minutes on the clock. That's my countdown for the sermon. What if this is my last message? Then I better make it the best message I ever had. Every single one of us needs to know that every time you get a mic, every time you walk through the door, every time you get a new screen, every time you get another opportunity, you kick the door in. I need a 10 second praise break in here. <laughs> High five three people tell them max 
out. Max out. Max out, baby. I'm not leaving any talent in that coffin. I'm going to exhaust every single thing I was created to do. And if this moment teaches us anything, it teaches you not to waste time because that's the one thing you can't get back. You can waste my money, but don't waste my time because I can't get time back. That's why some of you need to be thanking God for the relationship that didn't work in 2019. Oh, I know you're sad, but you need to thank God because they want a part of your destiny anyway. And so God can't because your promises in 2020 when you have clear vision. I wish y'all had some help in here. God knew what you were called to, and he didn't want anybody attached to your life who was not going to push you into the best version of yourself. There were people that were hanging on to your life that had no intention of growing, no intention of maturing, and no intention of helping. They just knew that you were gifted. They knew you were anointed. They knew you were on an upward trajectory. And they knew if they held on long enough, they'd go up too. But God in his love said, I got to get rid of dead weight because some people don't need to be in your life for where God is taking you. You better preach, I am. LA, y'all a little more casual. I'm a black preacher and I need a little bit of. I know that's not good. Yeah. Second Timothy 4, verse 6. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle who was Saul, who was complicit in the murder of believers who's watching while Stephen the martyr is being stoned. They throw their coats at the feet of Saul. Saul, who was so committed to his theology that Jesus himself had to come down from heaven and knock him off his high horse, excuse me church, because there's still some folk who are on their high horse looking down at people like they know something that they others don't. And you in your pride are pushing people away from God when we're called to bring them towards God. And Jesus came down and said, Saul, why are you fighting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm the one whom you persecute. The Bible says he went through a supernatural conversion experience. All those years of religion that he never knew God. Just because you come in this theater doesn't make you closer to God. Just because you sing these songs doesn't mean that you're maturing in the things of God. You know when I know you've been walking with Jesus? When you treat people right. I'll know that you've been walking with Jesus when you don't have pride on your spirit. You know when I know you're walking with Jesus? When you don't drive past the tent city, you stop your car and get out and pray for the people. That's when I know. That's when you know you've been walking with Jesus. When you don't look at people who are broken and think that you're more valuable to God than they are. That's when I know you've been walking with God. Because the longer you've been walking with God, the better you treat people. And the longer you've been walking with God, the less you judge people. And the longer you've been walking with God, the more you remember where you were when the blood found you. So you don't judge people because you remember that he picked you up, turned to you. I need a four second praise for you. Paul was wrecked by an encounter with the real Jesus. It changed his whole life. He lost friends, relationships, family. And the great tragedy of today's contemporary church is we want to be accepted and we want to be cool and we want comfort. But the real church is willing to live dangerous and willing to lay it all down for the cause of Christ. And Paul said, if I lose it all, but I gained Christ, then I gained it all. But if I lose Jesus and have all this stuff, then I have nothing. And that's what happens in today's society. That's why you got millionaires and billionaires putting needles in their arms and, and, and pills in their mouth and liquor in their, in their bloodstream and putting bullets in their head because you can have millions of dollars but not have peace. Amen. 
real quiet in here. I find the spirit of depression that sits on people and makes you think that you don't have value, that you can't get out. That's why we need one another. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Wrote 60% of the New Testament, and here he is at the end of his life after being snake bit and shipwrecked, a day and night in the open sea, stoned, broken, beaten, bloody, arrested, and now at the end of his life, about to be beheaded, sitting in a Roman prison, and he's writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. And of all the things that he says, he says these words, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Tell somebody, keep fighting. And then look at somebody else, tell them, keep running. Last one, tell them, don't give up. <laughs> oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Woo. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Tell somebody, keep fighting. Keep fighting. Keep running. Keep running. The last one is hold on. Say, hold on. Hold on. I kept my faith. I only got a little bit left, but I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to hold on to it. And I want to speak for the few minutes that I have with you from this subject for those who are taking notes in your premium flower print journal <laughs> that you pull out during small groups to prove how brilliant you are with three different colored highlighters. And God was speaking to me in a dream last night. You are not going to believe it. It's so amazing. It's like, Holy Spirit, but it's four in the morning. But if you want me, I am your. <laughs> <laughs> Write down this title Lessons from a Life Well Lived. Lessons from a Life Well Lived. I know that for some of our more theologically astute people, you can surmise that I am going to briefly attempt to draw parallels between the life of the Apostle Paul and the life of Kobe Bryant. Ooh. 